All righty, guys. Welcome back to the 503 for the Fans podcast. This is episode two, and I'm glad to be here. I'm Noah Patterson. This is Chase, and man, it's going to be a good one today. All right, we got a lot more prepared, and we're going to be a lot more sharp today, so I'm excited to get down with you guys. Um, we'll just kind of go into our predictions for tomorrow night's game. Chase was just kind of talked about earlier before we started this, like how crazy the season it has came around. I mean, it's just been crazy. Um, I mean, you know, the whole Dame saga this whole summer, it felt like that summer was the longest summer of your entire life. And then we, we get back into the season and, you know, we can kind of get past that a little bit, obviously. And yeah, let's just go into the Clippers game. Uh, first off, I just want to have your, what's your thoughts on tomorrow's game? And what do you think the Blazers would need to get a W tomorrow? Let's drop that in the comment section, boys. Let's get it going. So our spread right now, I believe, is about a, a minus nine, which is crazy to me. Um, I actually think this will be a really competitive game tomorrow. Um, I'm very excited to see that being a competitive game. We're fully healthy, like you just mentioned earlier, besides Ish Wainwright. Um, so I'm excited to see Robert Williams' debut. I think he'll have a major impact for us right off the bat. For sure. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's too big of a gap between the two teams um, starting right now in the season. I think we're going to have a lot of energy, a lot of um, excitement to get out of our system. I think we're going to play super fast early on. That's kind of one of the things I'm expecting to see. Um, but the one thing I'm probably going to put my uh, cap on and what I'm going to be looking at the most is the dynamic between Aiton and Scoot. I think they can have a big impact on whether or not we can win this game or not tomorrow. So, yeah, that's kind of my prediction. I would say we cover the spread. I'm actually going to pick the Blazers to win tomorrow. Okay. I think we're going to start off with a W. I like it. I mean, you know, I think that obviously depends on what kind of game Aiton has. Um, yeah. The Clippers were announced that I think Terrence Mann won't be playing tomorrow night. Um, so uh, that's going to be a big loss for them. He's a really key guy for their team um, and a good defender who they could throw on, you know, someone like Anthony or Scoo. Um, but, you know, yeah, no, I, I, I predict Portland to to beat the spread for sure. That's my that's my bold prediction is they beat the spread. I don't necessarily think maybe they win. Um, you know, we've had kind of a tough time playing in L.A. against the Clippers. They've kind of always been our Achilles heel, um, especially during the Dame era. Um, I don't know how much that changes tomorrow. Um, but, yeah, no, I do. If the Blazers win, that wouldn't surprise me. I, I do think the plus nine spread is kind of high, especially for a team that doesn't have – you know, an electric home crowd, you know. If this was in Denver and we're playing at Denver first game of the year, yeah, I would, yeah. you know, obviously it's going to be above 10. But, you know, I don't, the Clippers don't have the highest, you know, you know, it's vibes as their home <laughs> opener. So, um, you know, they're the second team in L.A. And uh, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if the Blazers do win tomorrow. I do really do predict them to cover the spread uh, in minus nine. Um, I think it'll be a close game. I think eight in, in that Zubak matchup will be something you'll have to look at as well. Um, I think that's a really important. If Aiton can beat Zubak regularly and Anthony has himself a good night, I think Portland's in a really good spot. And, you know, like you said, I think Rob Will is going to be a really, really big impact for his team, even in small minutes. Um, I don't really project, project him to play above 20 minutes p tomorrow. But even in 15 minutes, Rob Will can give you a lot. So that Clippers game is is going to be a big one for Portland. Um, if they can get on the right foot and win this game, you know, I, I'd, I'd feel really good about it. So um, we'll just kind of talk about matchups in that game. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about how Chauncey, Chauncey Billups came out and kind of confirmed that, Dan, uh, not Dan, <laughs> that Scoot, Anthony, Matisse, Grant, and Aiton will be the starting lineup. Um, uh, what's your thoughts on that? I know you kind of said that's kind of what your pick yeah. last week. but Yeah, I, I expected it. Um... Like I said, that's his safety net right there, Matisse Thibel. Um, I'm not surprised. I think he's. I think that's what he was, his plan was to start the whole year. I, I don't think he ever really looked too much at Kamara like we wanted. Um, yeah. Sharp obviously probably had a little bit better of a chance to get that starting spot. But, yeah, I'm not too surprised. Um, I think it's actually probably the best for Shaden Sharp to come off the bench now that I think about it a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, I think his role will be more – um, in tune, he'll be the one of the main guys off the bench instead of being that fifth option in the starting lineup. So, yeah, yeah no, and Shane will have a chance to assert himself a lot more off the bench, and and I just kind of want to like look at the last year's bench versus this year's, and I mean it is night and day, night and day, yep, night and day. And, you know, you could you could technically say Justice Winslow was the Blazers' sixth man last year to start the year, which is unreal. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, pardon me, but yeah, dude, that's just 
it just cracks me up. Um, I think this team is they're much deeper, especially with Rob Williams there. You know, they have Sharp, they have Kamara coming off the bench. They have Rob Will, they have Brogdon. That's a that's a legitimate top nine. Um, okay. I think that's one of the best benches in the league is Brogdon, Tamari, uh, Shaden, and Rob. I don't think the, the Blazers, in my opinion, have the best big rotation in the B- NBA as well. Um, especially depending on what type of player Aiden looks like. If Aiden's an all star, um, yeah. all star type player this year, I mean, dude, having him and then having a, a, a second punch like Rob Will coming off the bench, and especially even in times playing him next to Aiden. I mean, mm-hmm. the Blazers' big rotation's in a better place than it's been in a long time. You know, maybe since that Joe Pris- Joe Prisbilla and Greg uh, early Greg Oden days. Um, yeah, I don't remember much of Joel, but <laughs> dude, dude, Blazers' favorite one of my he's one of my favorite players of all time. He, he falls on the line with like Steve Blake and oh wow, um, okay. yeah, no, dude, dude, he was my mom's favorite dude. He was just a he was he was a Zach Collins before Zach Collins in the sense of like feistiness. You know, Joe was a lot more feisty. Joel, um, I loved him. You know, you, you definitely got to watch some stuff. He, yeah. he was a great. Him and Shaq had some battles, and it, oh, they were wow. just awesome. They were just awesome. See, there was, this was before like I started deeply watching basketball. I was probably like seven years old, eight years old when Joel was on the team. I remember his last name because I was like, how do you say this last name? Prisbilla, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, no, he was a dude. Love that dude. He, he, he battles he with Shaq, though. That's crazy. <laughs> yes, dude. They got into it all the time. You got to look it up on YouTube yeah, after this. But, but yeah, no. Um, yeah, no. Just getting back to the Portland, I think they're in a really good spot. I think the bench is in the re- it's really deep. And um, I, I obviously, I mean, you kind of made predictions last year. I don't really – not last, last stream. Um, I, I think obviously Portland's going to struggle at times. But I do think this bench – is going to help them a lot more than it, it obviously would have last year. You know, if you give this bench to last year's team, I think they could have stayed as a top three team in the West for sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that uh, that's moved past forward. Um, I think the predictions for tonight, uh, tomorrow night is Blazers got to play fast. They got to contain Paul George. Um, he has been a Blazer killer for a while. Um, I, Kawhi's going to Kawhi's gonna be Kawhi. Um, you know, you just got to kind of – also when it comes to the Clippers, you you can almost just kind of let Kawhi and PG do their thing. But you got to contain the, the role players, you know. I remember that game last year in Portland when I think PG and Kawhi were out. Or I think it was just Kawhi. Maybe PG played. But I remember when Norman Powell went off for like 20 in the fourth. And we were like – we were playing our starters. It, it, there was no reason for Portland to lose. Yeah. And, um, you know, it. you just can't let role players, especially on teams like that, just do everything. Um, you know, it, it's going to be funny to see Norm, Norman Rocco though, again, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm interested. You, I have a question for you. Do you yeah. think we'll see any of that eight and Robert Williams start or putting minutes in together combination first, tomorrow? Yeah. First game. Yeah. Hmm. I don't really feel like the Clippers are a team. You can do that. I, I that, that, that also depends on how healthy Rob is. If when he's healthy and he's, he's quick enough to, to switch, he's quick. He's a quick enough big to switch. He can switch three for three through five, arguably. Um, I maybe in, in moments, but the Clippers kind of play small a little bit. You know, they kind of play yeah. with that that small ball like Nick Batum and Kawhi at the four, and um, I think that'd be a hard team to play against. Um, yeah, but no, right. I, I, maybe Chauncey, maybe Chauncey goes for it. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I I I think Rob is going to be really good in those spurt minutes and especially against Mason Plumlee uh, if Rob can win that matchup against Mason I think that's gonna be really big for Portland and and how they play this game tomorrow yeah. um another one is is for you is what are you expecting defensively out of Portland are you expecting them to you know <laughs> I don't think we'll be very good defensively I think we'll have some moments here and there um Clippers are more of a half court team um at least with Kawhi and Paul George being there. Yeah. No, so yeah. that'll help us out a little bit. I think we'll be able to get back on defense a little bit more. But I think our offense being efficient and consistent, not taking bad shots and turning the ball over a ton will help us on defense. Um, but I still expect us to have a, a game where we're going to have to outscore the Clippers. Um, it's going to be like a 120, 115 type game. Um, not yeah. expecting too much from their defense, but. Especially you know, day we'll one. Just yeah, a day, we'll day one game, you know. Um, if Portland has any chances of being like a top 20 defense, it's going to come down to um, how good a defender Scoot is as well and how 
if Anthony can take another step defensively, like I said he can, um, you know, Matisse is always going to bring it. I really, like we said kind of last podcast as well, is like I do pray that Chauncey doesn't put Jeremy on guards this year. Oh, like, please. Like, please, yes. dude. Um, <laughs> please just put him on PG, like, honestly. Yeah, or put Matisse on PG and put Jeremy, put Jeremy on, in on the Kobe. corner or something. I don't yeah, know. just put Jeremy on Kawhi, you know. That's yeah. So just, just – Trust Scoot and Ant to stop their ball handers. I don't know who they're necessarily going to start tomorrow, um, Clippers-wise. I would expect it to be like Paul George, Kawhi, Zubak, um, maybe Norman Powell. Because, yeah, Norm. Because, yeah. And uh, I, don't, I can't move <laughs> the fifth. I don't know. Uh, maybe like – who knows? Who knows? Who cares? Yeah. Um, anyways. Um, <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see what know. happens. I, I can't put their lineup on top of my head. I don't think they're going to start Marcus Moore Sr. I don't really see that after um, – maybe they do. But anyways, yeah, no. I think Portland has a big chance to come to come away tomorrow with a W. Um, it would be a big offspring to their to their season. And, you know, I really do think in young teams it's really important to get off to good starts, you know. For sure. If, Port, if Portland gets off to, like, some, like, three and eight – start and we're just not playing well you know it's gonna be it's gonna be a rough time i think portland's first 10 games are pretty tough um our whole schedule is really tough man do we have some crazy road, yeah, road we, trips we got a death row worth the schedule we got a <laughs> lot of games that are back to back not back to back but we're playing the same team twice you know what i mean in the same we have like i think it was like three or four stretches where we're playing the same team twice on the road or something like that yeah and then we also no. have some where it's like that defeats the purpose. I think Tori had a video about this. It defeats the purpose of having these like long road trips because you're going to a place for two days and then you have to go back home. You're playing against the same team twice. You're not covering a bunch of East Coast teams. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, no. So yeah. No. At the, the Portland just gets the end of the bargain every single year because how much we have to travel. You know, Damon CJ have talked about that a lot in the past. Is how much how many miles Portland has to travel travel each year, and that's why I really do hope for you know a, a league expansion. Um, especially if, if they were able to get a Seattle team up there and um, to get, like, Las Vegas. And, you know, that would be really big for the Blazers in the sense of, like, just playing teams and having division yeah. that makes sense. And um, But, yeah, no, I'm just kind of going to read off the Blazers' first 10 games and we can kind of just see Give where they are. Prediction. So, yeah, so, no, the, the first 10 games is at L.A., obviously, tomorrow. Then they open up at home against Orlando. And then they go on the road for three straight games, 76ers, Raptors, Pistons, and then so that's their first five. Mm-hmm. Um, for the first five, I could see, I could see them. You know, it's a home opener, um, especially if they win that LA game. I think that'd be really big for them. Um, I, I, I would predict them to beat the Magic. That's gonna be a big game. Magic always are, are gonna be tough, and um, so yeah, I'm excited um, to go. I'm probably gonna go to a Magic Blazers game down here oh, in yeah. Florida. Yeah. So for you guys that don't know, I'm actually in Florida right now in the Panhandle. So you got a Florida Blazers fan here. So I'll, be, I'll be checking out uh, Orlando games and maybe some New Orleans games versus the Blazers this year for yeah, sure. Yeah, we need we need all the fans we can get, man. That's oh, yeah. and yeah, no, actually, I can just kind of bring it into this, like you know, tell me about yourself. Like tell tell those people how you became a Blazers fan. You know, I do you have a profile picture with Dame? Yeah. Um, you know, I've always that was like the first eye catcher when I you first kind of followed me on Twitter. I don't know how long ago, but obviously, yeah, yeah. Uh, was like, oh man, this guy's met Dame. I I I've only met Dame once, so that's pretty cool yeah um, so it all started with my dad he's actually from the portland area he was born in portland he went to david douglas high school um he was always a big blazer blazer fan growing up and honestly i he moved to california and that's where i grew up i grew up in california so i had the option to be a warriors fan and just stay with the the norcal flow but I just couldn't rock with them, man. <laughs> I was a big Blazers fan. LaMarcus Aldridge and Brandon Roy were my two guys growing up. That's Those were my idols when I was younger. I remember watching Brandon Roy ball out against the Mavericks, and that was the first playoff series that I ever watched. So yeah. ever since then, man, I've just I've been a Blazers fan. And I, it's been painful, obviously, but <laughs> it don't matter. I'm going to be here till the end. Hey, man, that's you're a fact. In- you're in Florida shouting through the roof, so, you know, that's always yeah. a good thing, and that's always going to show, you know. You could easily switch up, you know. There's a lot of fans that switch up like that, you know. And, yeah. you know, it, it's hard to be dedicated, especially to a small market team, but, you know, I don't blame you. You know, like, I've uh, – my whole entire, like, a part of my family is from uh, Boston and, mm. and Maine, and um, I'm, I'm a big New England Patriots fan uh, and a big Boston Red Sox fan as well. So there you go. I have yeah. ties over there, and, you know, I've, I've, I've grown up in Oregon. I'm, I'm born and raised from Santa Oregon. So, um, 
you know, just the Blazers has been my entire life. You know, my aunt uh, had season tickets since I could, she used to, like, remember, like, four or five. And I've been going to games since the, the Jailblazer days, you know. Oh, that's um, awesome. And, yeah. and, you know, my last name's Patterson. You know, the weird enough, the first player I've Ruben. ever liked, Ruben Patterson. It, not a good player to like, in a sense. Um, I think it's, <laughs> it, it, it's... People, you know, he was a Kobe stopper <laughs> during that time. So it was, it was Ruben was a funny guy. Um, but yeah, no, that's the first ironically first guy I liked. So I was like, oh, he has my last name. Um, but you know, just growing up in Oregon, it, it, it's been a Portland or die for me. Basketball's been my favorite sport in my entire life. So um, yeah. that's just something I've, you know, just greeted gratitude towards. You know, Oregon doesn't have an NFL team. Um, like I said, I'm a Patriots fan. Or MLB. Um, or or hockey. MLB. Yeah. Uh, we, we, yeah, our hockey team is the Winter Hawks, which is I can't even you know it's like the second to last league in the NHL. I didn't know um, they had a hockey team. Like, yeah, yeah, no. So yeah. at the old uh, Coliseum that the Blazers used to play, uh, that's where the uh, Winter Hawks play. Hmm. Um, okay. So yeah, it's called the Winter Hawks. Yeah, yeah. I've been a couple games, and it's it's fun. You know, it's it's hockey. You know, oh, yeah, we don't we don't watch, we man. don't have too much of that in Portland. Um, but yeah, no, it just. It was nice to you know just to tell them a little about, about ourselves and you know yeah. and I, we got so we got a lot to talk about this episode and we'll, we'll kind of just move on. I think we were kind of talking about the ske- the schedule. Yeah. Uh, like I said, they played the Clippers, Magic, 76ers, Raptors, Pistons, and then they come back at home against Memphis in the doubleheader, um, and then they play at the Kings and at LA for the so tough and man. at yeah <laughs> and at Utah. So they have. And their first 10 games, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They play three games at home in their first 10. So that's really, that's that's a tough start for a rookie team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, I'm not, I don't have the expectations for this team. You know, that's, I've said this in the last one is like, you know, it, it's hard to have expectations. If they come out and they come out to some eight and two start, Sign me up on every book in the universe, but um, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's gonna be to me a rough start if the Blazers don't play like they should, in my opinion. So I just I just want us to go even. If we can go even in those games, that's a good start to me. Yeah, um, I kind of expect us to fall behind a little bit, maybe like a three and seven start, four and six. I know people probably don't want to hear that, but that's a no, tough I, tough schedule. Off yeah, I predicted. I tweeted out. I think like last week or so, like. Blazers first ten games. What what's your guys' predictions? I said it was like three and seven and four or six. Um, you know that's just a lot of road games for a team uh, who is very very new. And Portland played very very new. They looked like they they barely played against each other. You know, Anthony's only yeah. the only player with two plus years on Portland, and that's just not something Portland's really accustomed to. Um, we've really had players with a lot of years on them, and I just think it is important for the Blazers to get off a good start. And yeah, we'll just kind of move on. We'll talk about the Blazers' final roster spots and what they did. And uh, they went in ahead and waved John Butler Jr. and Baji. And I, I was kind of – they got more moves, but I was kind of confused a little bit. It was like, how come John John Butler Jr. and Baji didn't play at all in preseason? Yeah. That's a little weird. I think that's a little weird. You know, yeah. like they played every single person else. I saw Baji in a lot of practice videos. He was practicing. He was, you know, he's playing. John Butler was playing as well. Yeah. Um, so it was weird. I, didn't, I I would fully expect if you're going to kind of give them a second look at the two way, um, give them a for chance them to play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did see that John Butler got picked up by the Wizards as a two way. Yeah. So good for him. Um, he's a very very raw raw prospect. Um, he's got to fill into his body. Um, but he he is a seven footer that can shoot. Um, yeah. No, uh, I wasn't the biggest fan of John Butler Jr. No disrespect, but yeah, I just didn't. I think it was smart to move on from the two way, um, given they they did kind of they did replace him with Wreath, um, yeah. who who arguably could be on the roster over Moses. In my opinion, he should. Um, I think he's better than Moses. Yeah. yeah no. No. Don't, no doubt. Um, I think like Eric uh, Brandt uh, of Blazers Outliers, obviously he pointed out to me that um, that Moses is uh, part of his contract was guaranteed, so that's kind of where the decision came out from. Um, so that, you know, I, I forgot about that detail. So that's why I was kind of, I was like kind of questioning like why we chose Moses. Yeah. Um, but you know, that I was kind of telling fans like, Oh, well you, Moses isn't going to do anything. You know, at the end of the day, Rob, Rob Williams very easily could get hurt, you know, knock on wood. But, um, if he gets hurt, 
Moses is that backup big. Yep. He's the third big. So Moses is going to likely play this year. Um, it could be rough in those minutes. Um, I, you know, I just haven't seen enough from Moses to be a third center on the team, in my opinion. Yeah, he's more like that third guy on a bad, a really bad team. Yeah, and to you know, be fair, we might be a really bad team. <laughs> so, yeah, I kind of get why we brought him back. But we have this thing where, we're like, we we let players go, and then a few years later we bring them back. <laughs> it's like I'm tired of it. Yeah, I like no. Moses Brown. I think he's a good guy. Um, but yeah, I don't see much of a future with him. I like Reith. I, I really do like Reith. He's a little older. He's like 27, I believe. Right? Yeah, I think he's 26. Yeah, 26, um, 27. But man. I, the touch he has for a big is ridiculous, man. I don't think, I don't think we're taking much of a hit defensively compared to him and Moses. So yeah, no, nah, no. Nah. Even yeah. The rebounding too. Moses yeah. isn't really a good rebounder for his size. And the thing is, like you know, you I was kind of surprised when I you know we saw Reith in the summer league for us, and then he went and played for the FIBA games with Australia, and he actually mm-hmm. played really well for them. So I was like, oh, I mean, I like Reith. I like Reith's the game a lot. I think he, um, I don't think he's gonna be some. Star center. He's 26. I don't know how much room for improvement he has, yeah. uh, but uh, I, I think he is worthy of a two A. Um, and then the Blazers went ahead and uh, signed Justin Manaya to this two A as well. I like his energy. He's got a really good motor. Um, he's a really he really plays like with a lot of energy. He kind of reminds me of a you know not like a but he kind of reminds me of Josh Hart in a little way. Like he was rebounding the ball a lot, playing with a lot of energy. Um, he reminds me of like a a poor man's David Roddy. If that's a good comparison. Yeah, no, so I don't, no, no, but I I get what you mean. Like, he's going to be an energy guy. He's going to get rebounds. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a two way. Um, It was a smart two way pickup. I I like him. And then obviously, Portland has on their third, uh, which is new this year, is a, a third two way. Um, is Skyler Mays, and who are who is arguably another guy who could be on the main roster. Um, if it wasn't for Brogdon, he would be on the main roster. Um, so, yeah. um, you know, I love Skyler, and uh, Skyler's gonna be he's gonna be a really important for this team, especially if Portland decides to move on from Brogdon at the deadline. Um, I think he will step in and be that second or third point guard the Blazers need. Um, but yeah, no, we'll just kind of move on. Um, I think the Blazers made some smart decisions with that. Um, they also uh, signed Ish Wainwright. Um, he is, I think, he's twenty eight. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's a little old. He's old. He played in the Euro League. Um, he's its third year. He might be twenty seven. Uh, I, I can't really exactly point it, but um, they signed they signed him. He played on Phoenix. Um, Chauncey talked about in his interview. He just feels like he can. He's going to be that guy that's always going to be. Um, you know he's gonna be an end of the guy, end of the bench guy, supporting the team. He's gonna he'll probably give us some good moments defensively, but um, you know I I, I like the move. Um, yeah, it's we, worth a shot. Yeah, we we released Kevin Knox for him. Um, I, it, I it is sad for Kevin though. I do think he um, he had some moments though. Kind of surprised me. I was like, oh okay. Yeah, he did. We got to give him some credit. He did have some solid games, especially at the end of last year. He had a few games where I remember. But the, the thing about Kevin Knox, man, he stressed me out last year when we were in the midst of a tank off, right? And this guy's this guy's turning into prime Kevin Durant <laughs> in the middle. Of, like, it's the game is not. But I think he had like 27 one game. Yeah, he had like 27, was just not missing anything. But, yeah, he had some good moments for us. Um, it does suck for him. And it, it sucks for Blazers fans, too, that it had any hope for him maybe turning into something while he was here. Same with Cam Reddish. Both of those experiments failed. Um, so, yeah, dude, that yeah. Josh Hart trade, sheesh, man. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I know you want to go into that, but, yeah, I mean, trading. So, we've essentially traded Josh for Chris Murray and Cam Reddish into Kevin Knox. That's... Uh, well, Chris I, I Murray. Hope, I hope Chris Murray proves me wrong. Um, I tweeted out during the last preseason game we had. Um, I was a little bit worried about that Chris Murray, that Chris Murray pick. Um, I, I still am, you know, especially when you see a guy like um, Leonard uh, from Miller, Minnesota, yeah. Leonard Miller. Yeah, Leonard yeah. Miller. Like especially when you see him who went right behind him. Um, it kind of stings. It's like, dude, that it, that kind of confused me too. It's like, you know, Leonard Miller. Leonard Miller played with Scoot in the G League. Um, if he seemed like a guy Mike Schmidt would love too, yeah. um, not that's Mike Schmidt drafted, but like you know, there's a lot of Mike Schmidt footprints on a lot of stuff we've done this summer. Yeah. Even especially, especially since he's came here, there's been a lot of imprints on him. So um, that Leonard Miller pick, I, I really do wish we were taking him. I do think Chris will prove me wrong, and you know, it's it's, it's hard to jump on a rookie. Um, yeah. 
especially preseason. Um, but, you know, it, it isn't the most comforting that, you know, someone like, you know, even though tumani has been great, but someone like Tumani can come right in and kind of just play play Chris out of his position, mm-hmm. especially for when we when we took Chris first, uh, first round, 23rd. Yeah, I still – I didn't get the pick when it happened, and I still don't really get it. I think the pick would have made sense if we kept Dame around and we were looking for a guy that had some – experience under Bell. I'm pretty sure Chris played three years in college. If that that's made sense if we kept Dame, but after that, man, I it, it didn't make any sense, especially with Leonard Miller, like you said, on the board. That's who I wanted. I think that's a lot of Blazers fans in this community at least. They wanted the guy like Leonard Miller. But hey, Joe Cronin had Chris Murray, I guess, as like a top ten prospect along with Rupert. So <laughs> these guys were guys that he wanted, so you know, we'll see how it works out. The underlying fact about that 23rd pick was that the only person Portland worked out in that range um, was Maxwell Lewis, who I think went to second round. He was projected in that range, though. Yeah. Um, that's the only player Portland worked out. And it was pretty much the general consensus that Portland was going to trade that pick. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, maybe to someone like Chicago to get their picks back or... Um, you know, just kind of involve him, the 23rd pick in a deal, kind of like how the Mavs did to get Rashad Holmes. Yep. Um, just something along those lines. Um, you know, if you, especially like you say, like the Chris Murray thing is like, if you thought he was a top 10 pick, then why didn't you work him out? Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, it, I, obviously it was, it came to a time, probably Dame requested a trade before that, that the draft went down and Portland kind of just, um, what it want, what it run about their way. Um, we'll move on from that because I'm so tired of hearing that type of stuff. But yeah, um, it's hard sure. to not to mention it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I do think uh, Chris will prove me wrong. Uh, he struggled to shoot a bit in this preseason. That's normal. Um, he was a four-year college player. Um, it, it, I think the shot's going to be it, – for me, it's just about showing what type of player he can be and just being aggressive and not just kind of being that corner guy who's just going to sit in the corner all game and not really do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's important for Chris to kind of find himself some role minutes. I think it will kind of be like by committee and as that backup three and four. Um, I think Shaden will get a lot of minutes at the three. Um, and then you kind of get Tumani as a three, and then you kind of get Jabari and maybe Tumani at the four. That's going to be an interesting thing to kind of look at throughout the years. I think Tumani is going to get that role as that backup four. Um, but there is still Jabari Walker and Chris Murray behind him. So that could be an interesting battle for that spot right there. Yeah, no no doubt. Um, I, I do think Jabari, from my opinion, I do think Jabari will be the backup four just because of how much um, Chauncey raved about him during the, uh, during the summer. Um, I think Jamani will be that backup three, but I do think like Shaden will essentially be that backup three as well um, because I think he will get a lot of minutes at the three. Um, but Shaden will be that like in-depth chart backup two. And then you can kind of put Tamani as that backup three. And then, um, but yeah, no, I think the three is the biggest question for Portland this, this year. Um, I think it's really going to be important. And, you know, that's been the biggest question for Portland for a long time was the three. And, I, I you know, we kind of felt we kind of had that answer with Jeremy, um, especially with how he started out. You know, Jeremy's not a three, but, you know, that that forward that we've needed. Um Especially with how he started out last season. I mean, he started out like he was a, a, all-star. an all-star. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, you'd hope for the same with that as well for him this year. Is like, I really do hope Jamie can get out to a good start and kind of lead this team to a good way. And, um, and you know, I've been, I'm, I, 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 I'm not. I'm worried I'm not, about his shot chucking. That's what I'm worried about. Specifically. There was a lot of ISO in the preseason. Mm-hmm. A lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think for Jamie, it would it'd really be important for him to buy his role. I mean, we paid him. Um, he's he's going to be okay for the next five years. Um, obviously, I don't think he's going to be important for five years, but um, I think hopefully, Jeremy need- – Hopefully not. Sorry. I, don't want to cut you <laughs> off. I just don't want to be paying this guy $30, $40 $40 million when he's 33 years old, you know? Oh, yeah. No, especially on, on a non-contending team. It may, exactly. Actually, I don't know what – maybe Portland will be a contending team by the time he's that age. But, yeah, true. Yeah. Um, who knows? Um, like I said, I think it's important for Jamie to kind of buy into his role. If he, mm-hmm. you know, not too much ISO. There was way too much ISO in that preseason. It was just like, especially when like Scoot's playing off ball. I don't want to see Scoot play too much off ball. Um, he played a lot of off ball in the preseason. I feel like, right? Like, yeah, he did. I tweeted it out. It was like, I I think Scoot's gonna have to play some off ball because this is at the end of the day Anthony's team right now. 
Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, no, I think Scoo, I think Scoo isn't in the position right now, especially as a shooter, to be the consistent off-ball guy. Like he's gonna have to have the ball in his hands, especially. You know, I don't know why we don't run Anthony kind of like a Steph Curry style. I'm not saying he's Steph Curry, but you know, yeah. run Anthony off a lot of picks. Anthony's the one. He's a top ten shooter in the NBA. He should absolutely be getting a lot of off the screen action and a lot of off ball looks. Um, he's the more off ball player. Scoot is a really advanced uh, playmaker for his age. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think for, for you, I think it's I, I think it's really important for Scoot to have the ball in his hands. Um, what about I you? Agree. Yeah, I agree. I think Scoot needs to have the ball in his hands. That's why we brought him here. Like he's our point guard of the future, right? Like let's get the ball in his hands. Let him get his confidence. That helps with your confidence. You're not sitting in the corner or sitting on the wing just waiting for Jeremy to take a deep mid-range two or whatever. Um, so get the ball in his hands as much. Same with Ant. I think those two guys should have the ball in their hands the most, like you mentioned. Um, Jeremy does scare me a little bit with that. He's He got his bag, so I don't know how motivated he's going to be um, to have a, you know, a good system going. I think he'll – Hopefully turn into a player where we can have him as our one of our glue guys and he's like our defensive minded guy. Um, but I think his offense is going to be what he cares about the most. And <laughs> yeah. I'm a little worried about that. I won't lie to you. Um, we already struggled with him last year on offense and defense. So with Scooing, got a bunch of younger guys around him now. I don't know. I don't like that dynamic too much. Um, I'm hoping that we see a lot more scoot and ant with the ball in their hands though. And that, that falls on that falls on the line of Chauncey putting yes. those dudes in those positions as well as like, you know, I think there's a lot of like I, I, I do think there's a lot of uh Chauncey not really wanting to show all of his stuff in the preseason. Mm-hmm. Um I think that I hope, <laughs> you know. Um yeah. um obviously with how with how Portland treated the preseason last year, I don't think they showed a lot. I think it was just kind of get that game shape a little bit. Um but yeah, no, I think that falls in the line of Chauncey's coaching. And if he's going to put those players in the best positions to succeed, uh, like I said, in my opinion, I do think Anthony should be the one running off screens and kind of being that off-ball player, especially with how good of a shooter he is. And, you know, Scoot's going to find people as well. You know, I think Scoot, the Scoot in uh, eight and pick and roll is going to be really, really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's going to be one of the most impressive, especially young pick and rolls in this league. Um, and yeah, no, I, I, I'm excited to how to see they look as a whole team tomorrow too. I really am. That's one of the things I, uh, jotted down on my important things for tomorrow was that scoot and the eat and pick and roll. I think that'll be a huge dynamic for this team. Like you mentioned, I think that could be a big difference depending on how good or bad we are on offense. So yeah, especially how good of a finisher Aiden is as well. I mean, he was, I think top five, you know, I tweeted out a thing like, I think last month when the trade went down. Um, when we got Rob Will as well, was uh, the Blazers have two top five finishers in the NBA. Rob Will was number one um, at finishing around the rim, uh, rim, and then Aiton was number four. Um, and that's you know that's something that Nurkic really struggled at. And um, you know obviously uh, his injury plays a part in how much he kind of got up. And but Nurk has kind of always struggled with that. And I think it's really going to be a big difference to see. Um, guys who can consistently finish at the rim. And I think that's the biggest thing I'm excited about for DeAndre is I I really do think he's going to have a really good year. It just comes down to, for DeAndre, how he treats this year. Um, You know, is he going to really try to be an all-star? Because he has every opportunity to try to be an all-star, especially because he's going to be a main option on this offense every single possession. Um, So, you know, I'm just, I, I really do think it's, like I said, overall, I think, the season comes down to how much Portland wants it. Um, do they want to kind of make a run for something like, you know, a play-in spot? Or do they just kind of feel like, hey, this is going to be a really big process. We kind of just need to tank it down. And we got a, a good enough young core to wait like t- two to three years. Um, which is a route I, I really I'm, I'm, I am for. So Yeah, me too. I think either way, it's kind of a win-win for us at this point. Like, if we get out to a, a really good start and we're actually a, a solid team, we're a play-in team, maybe a playoff team, I don't see it happening. But that would obviously be awesome, like, no doubt about it. But at the same time, getting another top draft pick is also a great route to go. So either way with me, like you said earlier on, I don't really have many expectations. And that feels good, man. It feels good to not have expectations um, for this team because in the, in the past, it's been a lot of expectations and they've always failed. 
now we could finally be surprised a little bit. Yeah, no. So. In the past two years, you know, it kind of like it started out with expectations and it just plummeted. Um, especially yeah. after All Star break, both 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 of those teams the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of we, we've kind of got a taste of what it feels like. You know, I really do hope it's a more exciting tank. Um, you know, sure. I don't really want to see uh, Brandon Williams and. Uh, CJLB not to catch strays on those dudes, but you know seeing those dudes that especially that first tanking year when we had eight straight years of playoffs, I was like, oh my, like boom, man, like what are we yeah. watching? Yeah, it was bad. It was really bad. Last year was a little more fun because you know you kind of got to see Sharp kind of find his own, and especially towards the late in the year, Sharp was like really looking like he was going to be a you know a future superstar, which I still think he can be. Um, but you know, Sharper's just really coming to his own, and that's the one thing I did enjoy, especially like that Minnesota game. I don't know if you remember it. Mm -hmm. Um, he had 27, and they beat him, in the, and they cost Minnesota the eight seed because of yep. that game. <laughs> yep. And you know, you know, you could take that with the partial thing because you know that Minnesota win, um, maybe cost the Blazers Wemby. So, um, uh, <sighs> let's not talk about that. Let's no, move on from that. Let's dude, move on from that. No, I know that sucks. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, we'll kind of go away from the Blazers in a second. Um, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about. I wanted to. We were gonna do this last episode, but we kind of just needed to get everything on there and kind of go. But uh, we're. I'm just gonna give uh, standing predictions, and we can go. I'll go to the West, and you can kind of go your West, and we can kind of just go back and forth with the East, okay. and Sounds after good. that. Um, but for me, um, my my West predictions. The, the West is ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. Um, it, it is so hard to predict. Um, I got Denver first, especially how they look tonight against LA. Oh my gosh, they're they're gonna be a powerhouse for years to come because how young they are. Um, Denver, I'm scared of Denver. It sucks that we're in the Man, same division as them. They're so young. They're not so young, but they're young and they've played with each other for a long time now. The core has played with each other for a long time. They're still young. It's a scary team. Man. Yeah, scary Jokic team. is only 28 years old. So, yep. like, you know, um, he's going to be a big that's going to be good for a long time, too. So, um, you yeah, know, that's the thing is, like, I, not to say, like, the Blazers could have success like that Denver team, but that's why it, it does make it bitter to see how Portland kind of just went away from that entire 2019 roster. Um, you know, given the fact we couldn't re-sign Seth, he out he outplayed what we could have, but you know, it, it just sucked to see that entire team fall apart, especially after having the amount of success they did for the first time in a long time. It was a bad combination of both injuries and losing players, right? Rodney Hood tears his Achilles, and then you got Zach Collins starting to deal with injury. It was I was just at all that game. Fell apart, man. You, you saw Rodney Hood tear his Achilles. Yeah, it was oh. it was a Laker game. I was at that game, and I and that was also the game that. Scal Alicia Bear, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, yeah, he also yeah. Lobissier, he uh, banged these AD, and we didn't see Scal ever again. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if people people remember that, but uh, Scal was actually, I really loved Scal. He had some he had good some moments. moments. Yeah, he had some. He moments. had some moments. He had, and I was like, oh, okay, he can, this guy can play. Um, you know, and I was at that game when we lost Rodney and Scal, and it was like, are you kidding me, dude? Um, you know, especially how good of a year Rodney was having that year. I think he was like top three in the NBA in, in three point shooting, which is just crazy. You know, we, especially with that bubble team that happened, um, we really did miss Rodney on that bubble team too. Uh, you know, the greatest eight seed of all time. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, no, I remember. We were projecting, <laughs> a lot of people were saying we we're going to beat the Lakers in this, that, well, especially, especially after the game one win. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, was, that a good team time. was funny, but yeah. No, uh, going back to, into my predictions, I, I got Denver first. I got Phoenix second. I got the Lakers third. I got Go Golden State fourth, and then here's my here's my bold one. I got OKC fifth. Ooh. Okay, and then you can go into I got Sacramento sixth. I got Minnesota seventh. I got I got eighth. And ninth kind of being tied between the Grizzlies and Dallas. Okay. Um, I really do think the Grizzlies losing Steven Adams is going to be a really, really big loss for that team. Um, I think they start out the year without Jaw for 25 games. Yep. Um, they lost Tyus Jones, um, who's going to, you know, I, I think they'll be fine. They got Marcus Smart. Um, their defense is going to be really good. But I just don't, I don't know what they're going to look like without Steven Adams. And I really do think the big success of why Memphis was able to be a good team without Jaw last year, especially when he got hurt, was because of Tyus Jones. Um, Tyus Jones is really underrated. 
Um, I think he was he's one of the best facilitators in the league. A really, a, probably the best backup point guard in the league, in my opinion. Um, I think that's a, a going to be a big loss for them. But I do think Marcus Smart uh, get for them was really big. Um, I think he's going to be really big for them. But like I said, they're without Jaw for 25 games. Steven Adams is out for the rest of the year. Um, I think Memphis is going to – they're going to be fine. They're a gritty team. But I don't think they're – before that, I would have probably had them top five. But after yeah. that, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess, so I got Memphis and Dallas tied at that 8-9 spot. And then I got the Clippers at 10th, Pelicans at 11th, Portland 12th, Houston 13th, for, Spurs 14th Rockets Utah that the end of the West is so hard for me you know Portland could easily be that 16th 15th team um for me it's after the first two seeds man after the first yeah. two seeds for me I'm like ah it's a toss this up could go yeah. anywhere yeah. yeah go go ahead with your West I'll see if we how ours compare yeah so my number one seed is the Denver Nuggets I'm gonna rock with defending champions as the number yeah. one seed number two I have the Phoenix Suns now I'm a little worried about this pick because of the fact that I, I think this team is going to have a, a lot of star players missing games. I think there's going to be a lot of Bradley Beal missing games, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, et cetera, et cetera. So I think with that, I'm a little bit worried, but they obviously have the talent to be that number two seed. And if they could play a substantial amount of games together, they'll probably be a top three seed in the West. Um, following that, I'm going to have the Lakers at three. I think it's another thing with health with them, obviously. Um, but I think they're going to have one one or two more runs at competing for a, a title, maybe. Um, yeah, with they LeBron, look fine maybe. tonight against Yeah, they look, they, they look yeah, solid. Yeah, you know, yeah. AD had a really lackluster second half, and that, that's what loses them the game. Yeah. But, yeah, no, the Lakers are going to be good. Yeah. Yeah. And then number four, I know you said I think you had the Thunder at five, right? Mm-hmm. I have them at four. I'm going to put Ooh. the OKC Thunder at four. And I don't feel good about this at all. But every year I make a standings prediction. Some crazy team is, is 10 seeds higher than I have them or five seeds higher than I have them. Who had Sacramento at third last year? Please nobody. tell me. No one. Nobody. So, with that being said, I think Chet Holmgren is going to have a rookie of the year type season. I think he'll probably end up losing out to Wembenyama at the end of it, but I think he'll make it very competitive. Maybe Scoot's in there, hopefully, as well. Um, hopefully, yeah. But, yeah, I think Jalen Williams is going to take another step up. Both of them, both Jalen Williams are going to take another step up. Shy is going to be another – all NBA caliber player. He's going to maybe even take a step to being an MVP caliber player. I think that team is really well built together, man. And it's an exciting team. I hope we can kind of follow that model in a sense um, of building off of our draft picks and, you know, continuing to trust our young guys and have them develop no matter how long it takes. Um, Lou Dort, if only obviously. we had a GM like Presti. Sorry to cut Oh, you God. Off. No, no, you're good. <laughs> We're... The, <laughs> I'm not even going get to get into that because we'll have a whole hour conversation about <laughs> Cronin. But, yeah, man, yeah. That's a team that I wish I could model after, basically. And then yeah, fifth, I fifth, I have the Golden State Warriors. Um, I think they'll you know, remain a, a really good team in the West this year. Sixth, I have the Sacramento Kings. I think they take a slight step back. I think teams getting a year of tape on them and just – kind of seeing how they play. They haven't really improved very much, in my opinion. Like, they haven't gotten substantially better. Yes, they've played with each other for longer, so that'll be a benefit to them. Um, Chris Murray, or Keegan Murray, sorry, will take a step (laughs) up. (laughs) Uh, Seven, I have Memphis, and I believe you had them, like, eight, right? I had them eighth, ninth, yeah. Yeah, so Memphis, I think Memphis will be remaining in that playing range for most of the season. I think... Having Jaw will have him step up a little bit, but I think Desmond Bain. I think Desmond Bain's going to be an All NBA player, maybe All NBA oh, yeah. first or second. Not first team, second team was kind of where I had my All NBA team prediction. Um, and I got to give some credit to Reese because I was dissing, I was dissing my boy Desmond Bain for a little while. But man, that guy's a problem. Um, that guy's yeah, a no. problem. <laughs> yeah, no, Desmond's a good. He's yeah. he's a dog. He's a dog, dude. I, I remember. I think Portland had a pick around that range. I think, and I was. Uh, I don't know if they, I think Portland traded it, and that was part of why. Yeah, I think Portland traded it to Boston, and that was part of why. Um, anyways, but yeah, no, I, I like Desmond Bain. He was, he was a really good shooter in college. Um, yeah, no, Desmond's gonna be really good. I think he's gonna be a second, maybe. I think he'll be a third at NBA All Team. Um, especially with John missing the first twenty five games, he yeah. could probably average twenty to twenty five points per game. Honestly, I think he'll um, average like twenty five. 
Yeah, no, so, yeah, no, Memphis is kind of hard to spot with that. I, I think they'll be in that, like, seventh uh, through ninth range. So, yeah. yeah, no, I agree. So, yeah. you go ahead. With and your... then eighth, I'm going to have the Dallas Mavericks in there. Um, Luka, Kyrie, I think they have a chance to make the playoffs this year. I mean, they should. They really should, right? Like, if you have that type of talent, you should be a, a playoff team every year. Um, eighth seed is kind of lower for them, in my opinion. I think they could easily be – Maybe up where the Warriors or Thunder are if they have the yeah. season that I think they can have. But I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it modest. I'm gonna put them at eight. Following that, I have the Clippers at nine. I think they're a team that's that's what's so hard about this Western Conference. I think there's like from twelve to six to me. There's so much interchangeability in there. Like I yeah, think there's so many teams teams. that could be in different spots. But yeah, I had the Clippers at nine. Number ten, I have Minnesota making that last play in spot. Um, yeah, we got, I think a lot of people will come for you at that. That's fine. You know? that's no, fine. no, that's fine. Dude, yeah, yeah. I, Minnesota's hard for me to place too because you know it's like um, Anthony Edwards is going to be a top. He's a top fifteen player already in the NBA. Yeah. Um, I think you know Minnesota falls in that like Memphis line where mm-hmm. um, can Rudy Gobert and Cat kind of figure it out? If they can't, mm, I don't know. Oh yeah, speaking um, of the Timberwolves, they just signed. Uh, I think it's Jalen McDaniels to like a five year, one hundred and thirty five million dollar contract or something. Yeah, like twenty twenty seven mil per dude. They're yeah. gonna be like the they're gonna be like the New Orleans Saints in the, out of the uh, NBA. <laughs> just just having yeah, this really expensive roster. Uh, yeah. Kind of where Portland was, kind of in that two thousand nineteen pre era. Um, just a really expensive roster. I think they I think they were only like ten mil under the cap between four players now with like within. Rudy, that's ridiculous. Uh, Edwards, Jalen, and Cat. That is just wow. One of them's gonna obviously have to go, and I think that odd man out is gonna be Cat eventually. Yeah, um, me too. Me too. I, I think. They I think just, it's just gonna be too hard to move on from Rudy. Um, yeah, no, we, no, you can't. Yeah. At that point, you just kind of have to eat it up. You know, you trade. I think they traded five first, or is it four? Too many. They traded too many. Too many. Regardless, too many. <laughs> Like you said, like too many, like too many. But yeah. um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, no. Like uh, that Minnesota pick is it's hard too. Like like you said, dude, the twelve through six range in the West is a joke. It's a joke. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, go ahead with the rest of your <laughs> four, then we can move on to the East. Yeah. So the team I have fallen out of the play, and the first team out of the play, and is the New Orleans Pelicans. Um, I don't really have too much of a reason why I think they could easily have a really good season. Like I said, um. I don't know. I just think I'm just gonna rock with Minnesota here. Comes uh, down to health with 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 yeah, the Pelicans. That's it comes I don't down trust to, them. I don't trust comes them. Comes down to Zion and, and Bi. I think Zion and Bi between the two, those two have played like have missed forty games each the past three years. Mm-hmm. So like it, it's, and I you know it's crazy too. I think if New Orleans does have like a, a season where they miss the play in tournament again, I think I think we'll see Zion Williamson get moved. I think we'll see Zion get well, maybe CJ too. Just to get off of his contract, but I think this is a big year for the Pelicans um, to see if they either stay with that core or they move on and go to a new direction. They have guys like Trey Murphy, Herb Jones. Give the keys. Give and, the keys to Trey. There you go. So, either way for the Pelicans, I think you're going to have some silver lining for you guys this year. Um, number twelve, I have the Utah Jazz. I think they take a little bit of a step back this year. Um, I think the the West has just gotten better. You know, so with that being said, I think they fall out. And then 13, I have San Antonio. Um, I think Wembenyama, I think that young core with Vassell, Sokan, and Trey and Jones. Johnson. and Johnson and everybody. They got a bunch of guys over there. Zach Collins. Like. Zach um, Collins. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that team will be a little bit better than uh, maybe what some people are projecting. Um, they'll still be in that 13 to 15 range. I think 13 to 15 is probably the most confident I feel about the Western Conference <laughs> is those last three teams. Um, but yeah, so 14, I have Portland, our Blazers, as the 14 seed. I'm not going to have us as the worst team in, in the West. But I really don't think the gap between like 14 and like 10 and 9 is going to be very big. I think we'll have a competitive year. I think yeah, the no, West in general will be pretty competitive. I think Houston could even be competitive. So Yeah, dude, every team there, there's not one team in the West where, like, I think it's easy to kind of put Portland in that spot right now, but I think Portland will surprise people. That's not just me kind of being optimistic. I don't think they're going to surprise people enough to be, like, a legitimate playoff team, but I I don't think, you know, you, you slot Portland as that 15th seed, and, dude, like, I think they're, 
they're a really good 15 seed if they're going to be that 15 seed. So yes. probably the best we've seen in the very. This is the deepest yeah. the NBA has been ever. Yeah, opinion. it's really it's really it's spread crazy. out. It's really yes. spread out. I, I, that's one thing I do like about it. Um, but yeah, no, the West is like like I said, the West is really hard to predict. Um, uh, we'll just kind of just read them down, uh, readers down one time. We kind of talked in between. Read it down one more time, gotcha. and we can kind of just have have it on record. All right. So number one, we got the Denver Nuggets. Number two, we got the Phoenix Suns. Number three, we got the Los Angeles Lakers. Number four, we got the OKC Thunder and a shocker. Number five, we got the Warriors. Six, Sacramento. Seven, Memphis. Eight, Dallas. Nine, the Clippers. Number ten, rounding out the play-in is the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, Eleven and twelve is New Orleans and Utah, and then the final three teams are San Antonio, Portland, and and Houston in order. There you go. All right, so like I'll say mine. So I got Denver one, Phoenix two, Lakers three, Golden State four. OKC five, Sacramento sixth, Minnesota seventh, eighth. Um, you can kind of give a tie to Dallas and the Grizzlies, but I'll put Dallas as an eighth and Grizzlies as ninth, tenth, Clippers, Pelicans eleventh, Portland twelfth, Spurs thirteenth, Houston fifteenth, uh, and I mean so Houston fourteenth, uh, Utah fifteenth. Oh, I wow, think yeah, the, Utah last. So so the thing with me with Utah is like you know I think they could. They might battle some adversity here and there. I think it depends. If Lowry, if Lowry is healthy the whole year, they'll definitely be above that. Um, but in my opinion, I think Utah is in that spot where I think they should go and go for a top three pick. Um, I I think they're fine, but like they surprise people. But you know what's the scent? What what's their direction right now? Um, and it will kind of go off is like is Lowry going to be uh, a franchise player for the re- how how long um, you know so that's the question for me with Utah is like they could easily be above Portland Utah I mean Portland Houston and San Antonio uh, you know the West is just ridiculous uh, I really don't care if you roast me about my thing as well like yeah. you said with Minnesota it's like dude like who could predict that um, so we'll move on to the the East and we can kind of just move on to that and we'll kind of give our rookie of the year MVP but the East would kind of be quick um, for me I have Boston ahead of the Bucks. Um, I think the Bucks will kind of fall victim to a little, uh, you know, rest. I think they'll rest Dame here and there. I think they'll rest Giannis here and there. Um, I think they'll want to keep those guys fresh for the playoffs. Um, I think Boston is just a really deep, a, a deeper team. Um, so I think Boston will have that opportunity to be the first pick, um, first seed. So I got the Boston. I got Bucks second. I got the Knicks third. I got the Cavs. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in the Knicks. I think they're going to be really good next year. I like that. Um, I got the Cavs fourth. I got the 76ers fifth. The sixth, I got the Heat. I got the seventh as the Nets or the Pacers. So I got the seventh as the Pacers and the Nets as tied. Um, and then I got the ninth as the Hawks. I mean, the Magic and then the Hawks. And then we go with the Raptors, Wizards, Detroit, and Charlotte. Um, yeah. I like that. The, the, bottom, the bottom tier the, of the East is really easy way easier to guess in the west yes. way easier so mm-hmm. i think the hornets will be by default the worst team in the east um i think they're just you know you saw what kind of summer the hornets have had this summer <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was right there <laughs> i'm really that's one team i am glad i'm not a fan of um yeah. wow what a what a sh- and excuse i know me, what, what, you're what saying. a shit show okay Tori, a, we need a sensor beep right beep, there yeah right yeah what what a just wow dude they a terribly run organization. Respectfully, they just are. Um, but yeah, go ahead, give your East, and we can kind of move on to the winners. All right. So my number one is also the Boston Celtics. I think, I think they're the most. I think they have the best players that have played with each other the most. They're going to have the least. I would say learning period. I, I guess I would say they would have the the least the smallest gap. I should say. In, in terms of like learning each other as a team. So I have them at number one. I still think they're going to be elite. Number two, I have Milwaukee like you did. Number three, I have the Miami Heat. And I think the Miami Heat are just – last year I think they fell victim to not only injuries, but they kind of just had a really lackluster start to the season. Yeah. Um, they started to play good towards the end of the year, and we saw them obviously almost get eliminated in the play-in, but they, 
they deserved to be where they were and even higher. They were a better team than what their seed was, and I think that was very clear last year. So I think they'll be number three. Number four, I got the Cleveland Cavaliers. Number five, I got the 76ers. Number six, I got the New York Knicks. Number seven, I have the Atlanta Hawks um, making that first play-in spot. Number eight, I got the Orlando Magic. Number nine, I got the Brooklyn Nets. Number 10, I got the Toronto Raptors. Um, 11 and 12 are Indiana and Chicago. I think those will be the two first teams that missed the play-in in that Eastern Conference. And then, obviously, the last three teams are Detroit, Washington, and the Hornets in order. Yeah. We don't have to go much into the East. I think I, I agree with the list. Um, I think the, the top end is going to be, for me, I think the top three teams. Um, I, think the, I think the 76ers are, are, are in a spot where – if they don't make it past the second round this year, I do think that Embiid potentially looks to get out of there. Um, especially with just how he Embiid is. Um, he's never got past the second round in his entire career, which is crazy for a player to his magnitude. Yeah. Um, you know, the whole James Harden situation, I don't know if you saw. This was funny. I don't know if you saw what James Harden said to Daryl Mo- Morey. Said this time. Um I think Darren Morey was talking about how why Harden's not there, and he says, "I don't know. The last text I got from James Harden was F you." Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I love James Harden for that. Honestly, he's out of pocket for that. Like, I'm not. Bro, I thought these guys were cool. Like, I thought he came to Philadelphia that was, because yeah. of this guy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, dude. It's it, it was it's funny, dude. I, I it's more than funny with that whole situation has gone it's down. It's weird. Like, it's weird how open James Harden is, just slandering Daryl Morey. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I legitimately thought that was a whole joke when he came out and said, "I will never like Daryl Morey's a liar." I will never. I legitimately thought that was like a like a ball sack like you know twitter <laughs> tweet like i legitimately thought it was that i was like um that's not real right and no yeah. no there's a whole video of him saying it um I, I don't know if you saw but he went to the club and, he, and people were holding up signs like daryl Morey is a liar uh trade <laughs> like, he went to asia right and he was like that's yeah, all dude, he was dude, talking about <laughs> oh my god dude james hart honestly i'm not a big james harden guy um i'm glad da- i'm glad dame didn't go that route he probably could have, but um, you know it's funny to see a player kind of do that, especially to a to a, uh, a front office executive who pretty much has been around him his entire career. Yeah, um, so, weird. so it, it, that would essentially be like Dame doing that to O'Shea, and you know people might hear feel like Dame should have, but <laughs> um, that's that's just not who Dame is. Thanks. No, him, right? no, no. That's just, that's the whole yeah. thing when I laugh when Miami fans were trying to tell me like, oh, Dame's gonna. Like, when he gets traded to a new team, he's going to request out the second he gets there. That is not happening, dude. Dame, I, some Miami fans were almost trying to act like they knew Dame better than me. I was like, dude, I've been watching Dame since <laughs> 2011 every single day for, like, eight months out of the year. Like, come dude, Dame, on. Like, Dame is the most down-to-earth, just, just really cool dude. He's a superstar, man. You wouldn't even know it the way he treats people. Um, and, and the way he goes about his business in the NBA, it's all on paper, man. Like, he's one of the best leaders there is in the league, one of the best superstars no you doubt. can have in the league in terms of that stuff. Um, so, yeah, no and, and we can see that with, like, James Harden, Kyrie Irving. These guys are completely opposite, and it really has a, a profound effect on franchises, right? Dude, like, no, dude. <laughs> what has James Harden been since he left Houston? What has Kyrie been since he left Cleveland? Nothing. Exactly. No, they Nothing. haven't led anything. They no. Without LeBron James, what has Kyrie Irving done? I really want to know. Dude, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I've told Kyrie fans that my entire life, dude. What I used to, you know, funny enough is I used to be a big Kyrie dude, uh, like when he first got into the league because you know he wasn't a nutcase. And I'm not calling him nutcase now, but like he he could be. Um, but yeah, he's no, not a Kyrie, nutcase, man. But he's just I don't know. What's he, wrong he has with some him. takes. He has some takes. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. What you but mean. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, um, we'll go on to our kind of like our. our our winner, our award winners. Um, we'll go into the rookie year. For me, I got Shet winning it, um, but I do think he it falls in the line. I think I think it's like a Shet and Wemby will be there, but I think my I think my real pick is Scoot, and the only reason I say that is because I think it comes down to health and how much they play. Does OKC and the Spurs do they both give Wemby and Shet these full time roles where they're playing every single game? Can they stay healthy? And that's the biggest question for them. I think Scoot is going to be a really durable player. 
um, his entire career. He's he's really built. Um, I think he's gonna, yeah, knock on wood exactly. Um, but I, I am confident in Scoot's ability to be on the court at, at more than those dudes. Um, so that's like my real pick. But I, I think for me is I think Shet wins wins it because you know I, I have OKC four uh, fifth. Um, yeah, I like that pick. And if he's gonna be if they're gonna be the fifth seed and Shet is gonna be a big reason why they're the fifth seed. Um, I think he it. has. I think he should yeah. win it. And you know, if the Spurs are like a twelfth or you know, twelfth and beyond seed, I don't really see how Wemby should win it over Shet if if OKC is in that position. Um, so that's the thing. Like you know, that's the thing for Scoot too. Is if Portland surprises people and they sneak into the play in and somehow get an eight seed, um, I think that would say a lot more about Scoot as a rookie than it would for certain guys as well. So um, yeah. that's my rookie of the year. I got Shet winning rookie of the year. Um, my, my MVP is Tatum. Oh, um, okay. I like that. So, too. uh, I was going to go Luca here, but I don't have confidence in the Mavs ability to be a top four seed. Um, I think you, you can't win an MVP if you're below a, a top four seed. Um, I just don't see how that's a possibility. Um, especially w- looking at how much Dame has been, you know, Dame's been an MVP like player for, Especially like since 2019, and his teams um, have just never been good enough. His right? teams yeah. have just never been good enough, and I that's the thing where I think Luca's going to fall victim to is um, Luca would be my pick, but yeah, no, I think Tatum will win it. I think the, the Boston's the first seed. Tatum averages 28 plus. I think he should get the nod there. Um, uh, but yeah, that's my pick for there. And then my coach of the year, I got Mark Dagonal. I came pronounce his name. You got it right, Mark Dagonal. D- yeah, Mark Dagnall. Like that. Uh, OK, OKC is head coach. Yeah. Um, I think if OKC is a top five season in, in the NBA, um, I think that young core I, getting them there would definitely be coach of the year worthy. Um, and then my sixth man. This is why I have the Knicks so high. Is um, I think my sixth man is going to come down between Josh Hart and Isaiah Hartenstein. Um, I think Josh Hart. I know. I think he will come off the bench. I think they're going to start. Um, Grimes. I think he. No, yeah, Grimes, um, Jalen, Jalen Barrett, yeah. and then you go uh, Julius Randall and Mitchell and Mitchell. And Mitchell. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so I think it would be a kind of like that Clippers type vibe where it's like Lou Will and uh, Montrezl Harrell kind of, kind of type. Where it's I really think Josh, or jo- yeah, I think Josh or, or Hartenstein will be the sixth man of the year. And then the last pick for me, the Finals winner and the Finals MVP, I think it's going to be the Bucks. I think the Finals MVP will be Giannis. Ah. Oh. Um, I love Ooh. Dame. I love Dame. You know, I would love throw throw it for Dame, but I think Giannis is going to be, you know, Dame's going to be like the best second option in the league by far. Um, but, yeah, no, I think Giannis will probably – if Dame wins it, finals MVP, sign me up in every book of, like I said, the university. I'm so for that. That would be such a big thing for his um, I'd be so happy for resume. Him, I just want him to win. If he wins, I'll be happy. So Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah, go ahead and give yours and we can kind of – Move on to the, the Twitter questions and get out of here. All right. So my rookie of the year, I was really debating between Chet and Victor. Um, like your point was that the Thunder are probably going to be a pretty good team this year, and that should benefit Chet, right? I also agree to that, but I am going to pick Wembenyama. I'm going to pick Victor. I think the difference with Victor is I think his defense is good. I, I know Chet's a good defender, but I think I think Victor's he might lead the league in blocks his rookie year. Yeah. Um, and he's going to give you 20-plus a game, 10 rebounds. He's probably going to average more assists than this guy, Chet. So I think the statistics are going to be on Wemby's side in pretty much every category. Um, I think, obviously, the Thunder are going to be a, lo- a lot better than the Spurs this year, but I could be wrong with that as well. Um, I just think Wemby's he, – he's the best rookie I've ever seen in my life. Oh, my it's God. It's not yeah. even close. So that's the thing for me is, like, with Wemby is, like, does it come down – he is easily the winner – if it, if he plays sixty games or more, yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna have Wemby as that rookie of the year. Um, I'm not sure. Did you go MVP after rookie of the year? I went MVP. Uh, okay. I went MVP. So my um, MVP yeah. is gonna be Jokic. I think he's gonna reclaim his throne. He's gonna be a third time guy. Um, I think that team's gonna be right in the the run for the finals again. I think his numbers might even be a little bit better this year. You're gonna see no Bruce Brown, no Jeff Green. So there's some production being taken away there. Um, and we saw tonight, dude, like if Jokic has this like scoring mindset, he's unstoppable. He's he unstoppable. Around the rim, it's ridiculous. It's... Dude, he just, he makes the, like, 
I've never had this in my life. Like, before Jokic, like, there was guys, you, you, when they take their shots, you know they're missing, right? Like, if it's a bad shot, he's, he's missing that. Jokic will throw stuff up that I've never seen before, and it just goes in every time. It does not Dude, make sense. 29, <laughs> 13, and 11 is disgusting. Is that, is that what his line was tonight? Yes. Jesus yes. Christ. <laughs> it's game one. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> See, that's the thing for me with Jokic is I think he's going to fall victim to uh, the voting tax. Of, Maybe. Uh, like, like like Giannis. You know, Giannis, I think that's kind of where it falls on the line. It's like, hey, he won back-to-back MVPs. We kind of feel like someone else can get it. But, yeah, no, Jokic is a, it's going to be in the top five without a doubt. The reason why I say he might get it this year is because last year, I think the entire NBA post, once they gave Embiid the MVP, realized that they probably should have gave it to Jokic again, um, especially when you saw what he did in the playoffs and led his team to a championship. Obviously, yeah. it's a, a regular season award. Um, but the margin between him and Embiid was very, very small last year, very thin. Um, yeah. So I think he'll have he'll have that third MVP. Um, so my defensive player of the year, I have Giannis winning defensive player of the year this year. Reason being, I think Dame's going to take a load off of him offensively. I think he can really be that lockdown defender that he was. Uh, he's still always going to be a really good defender. I think he took a little bit of a step back last year. He also was dealing with some injuries um, more than he usually does. So maybe that had something to factor into it. But now that Drew Holiday's gone, I think Giannis is going to have to take responsibility as that lockdown defender. That He's that guy now, um, yeah. again. So I think Giannis wins Defensive Player of the Year. I think they're going to be a really good team, obviously. Sixth Man of the Year, I had a really hard time deciphering who I wanted to put for Sixth Man of the Year. Um, I went back and forth with like normal guys that you see. Um, but for me, I'm going to go Bobby Portis. I'm going to go Bucks heavy here. Bobby Portis, I think, has a, a chance a to pick. be a really good player off the bench this year. He always has been. Um, but I think he's going to have a, a responsibility in rebounding, especially. He's going to be that number one guy in terms of scoring off the bench. Um, and like I said, that team's going to be really good. I do really like your Josh Hart pick, though. I'm, I'm a big fan of that Josh Hart pick, um, and I could see that coming to fruition. I think if the Knicks are a top three seed in the East and – um, I think Isaiah Hart and Stein and Josh Hart are two of the best bench players you could have in the league. Yeah. Um, that's where I think, um, like I said, I think if Portland can get towards that area with their bench, I think they'll be in a really good spot. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, no. Like I really, I think the Bobby Portis is a good one. I think if the the Bucks are a top two seed and Bobby comes out and averages fifteen and seven. Something off the like bench, that, yeah. something like that. Um, I think, yeah, he'd be in a really good spot to win it. I think he has a little bit more responsibility this year offensively. I think Chris Middleton is going to start to regress a little bit. Yeah, um, and, and I feel with bad that, about him. Yeah, he's just, I mean, everybody has these injuries once in a while, and it, sometimes it's just, it alters people's careers, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I still think Chris is going to be a really good player for this team, no doubt about it. But I think Bobby Portis and Brooke could fill in as those fourth, fifth guys on any given night. Um, so, yeah, I think Bobby Portis, sixth man of the year. Now, my coach of the year, I think Joe Mazzula gets it. I think the Celtics are going to be the best team in the league um, yeah. record-wise. So, with that, I think you – especially since he hasn't won it before, I think they'll give it to Joe Mazzula. Um, That's a good one. Which will be really cool. I think Joe Mazzula is – he's one of my favorite coaches in the league, man. Um, I respect the guy a ton. Um, he's a really nice guy, down-to-earth, great coach. So, I think that'll be it. A good thing to see if he can get that. Now for my finals winner, I know you had finals winner and then finals MVP. I didn't really think about this too much, but if I'm just going to go off the top of my head, ah, I don't want to just. I'm going to go Milwaukee, but I'm also going to. I'm going to go Damian Lillard for that MVP, the finals hey, MVP. Hey. I'm just going to speak these good things into existence. You know what I mean? So yeah. So hey, hey man, why not? We're home. We're homers. My awards are definitely Bucks heavy, but I think. There's some some reason for that. Yeah, I, I just realized I'd even I'd even put the defensive player of the year. I would agree with that Giannis pick. I do think Dame takes a lot of pressure off him, um, and that's the beauty of having a, a star teammate like that. Is like you know you know like how it was with Dame like you know we were begging for so long to have a star offensive teammate so Dame just didn't have to put his entire shoulder on this team. 
and just take everyone on his back. Um, but yeah, no, I think Giannis will be in a really good position to win that because of Dame and how much he's going to carry the offense for him as well. Um, but yeah, th- th- those are those are good predictions. It's good to get these out, especially the day before. I mean, obviously the season started today, but you know you can't know those things. The season now. really starts tomorrow. We're, for, we're correct. We're on we're Blazers Uprise Live. Guys. Yes, so. <laughs> correct. No, Blazers uh, season does start on tomorrow. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll kind of wrap this. Uh, I think we'll do this every single podcast. I'll kind of just wrap. We'll just wrap up each podcast with Twitter questions. Um, I'll read them out for now, um, and then in the next couple of podcast episodes, we'll have kind of graphics for you guys to look at. So it'll be kind of cool for you guys to kind of see your name up there and yeah. kind of see the questions you ask. But um, I got about seven questions we can answer, and I'll have you just answer them first, and I can just kind of go off them. Okay. Um, so this is Nolan Smith on Twitter. He asks. Uh, would you rather make the play-in or have a top three to five pick? Oof. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nolan. Um, for me, oof. you know what? I'm actually going to go with the play-in tournament because I think if we make the play-in tournament, that shows us that we're ahead of our expected development. Rebuild. Yeah. Yes. So with that, I think – and we'll still probably get a top 15, 16 pick or something like that. So – with that, I'd probably go with the playing tournament. I think that would be good for the fans to see too. Just to see a competitive team post Dame right away would be pretty awesome. Yeah. So I think I would go with the play in tournament. Especially with this draft, you know, draft this draft is, is it's very mid, you know. obviously you'd like Ron Holland, um, and uh Max Abbas or I I forget is Matas. Matas Buzelis. Yeah, Matas. Yeah, those are like the two guys you would love to get. Um also like all of uh Scar, Alex Scar too. Um, you know, there's like three, five, there's three guys. You know, I, I think I would agree too. I think it, it more would be like, you know, if they make the play in, um, you'd be really confident in what this rebuild's gonna look like over the next five years. Um, especially kind of like that. You know, we were kind of talking about how we feel like we want them to fall in that OKC line of rebuilds. Like, you know, OKC got into that um, that you know during the bubble with uh, with CP3 kind of leading that young team, and they got into that playoff. And it, it was it was really big for their development, especially um, if they're going to be a top five seed this year. Um, if Portland can sneak into that play in and somehow get an eight seed, I don't even care what we look like against the, in that first round. Just being there, just being there would just be there. You know, obviously it'd probably be against Denver, and <laughs> that series would not look pretty. But oh yeah, we'd get swept, but we'd be there. <laughs> We'd That's be there. No, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Um, so <laughs> this is a question um, from Boomer, uh, hashtag Rip City. It says, it's been assumed by many that Dame will return to retire a blazer. Do you think he will return just to take pictures in a uniform uh, one last time? Or do you think he actually might play for us in one of his last years to try to get a ring before he retires? Uh that's a good question. I think, obviously, we would all want that to happen for him to come back to Portland. I don't know how realistic that is. I know he's kind of hinted on Twitter a little bit that he might be willing to do that in the future. Yeah. In terms of if he's going to just be here to take photos, I don't think that's the type of guy Dame is. If he comes here again, he's going to want to have a role on the team. Um, maybe it's backup point guard for us, which would be kind of weird, but yeah. I'd be all for it. His contract doesn't end until he's 37, I believe. Um, and I don't see him coming back on that contract. No. Um, no. No. So that's the tough thing is, like, if Dame is somewhat of a player at 38, 39, we want to bring him as a backup point guard and he can kind of be that Kyle Lowry type. You know, I'm not saying he's going to be a Kyle Lowry at that age Chris or Paul. maybe that Chris, Chris Paul, Paul type. Yeah. yeah, Chris Paul type at that age. Sure, sign me up. I would love to have Dame as a backup point guard. He's going to be a really serviceable guy for a long time, and um, I think he'd be really important for this team as a leader, especially if he wins a couple of ships with uh, um, with Milwaukee. So, But like I said, yeah, I don't think Dame will return on this contract, this current one, until he, he it doesn't end until he's 37, so that's tough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't think he, like I don't think it's going to be some like, you know, uh, MOB type retire where it's like, oh, we were just retire him. He has a one day contract and he's just in Portland. Like, yeah, no, maybe. That's maybe. Not, I mean, I guess we're like, I don't see that. I think it's, no. if Dame's coming back, he's going to be on the team for at least a, a full season. Yeah. That's what I would expect. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, good, good question. These are both good questions to start out. Um, this, this next one's from Caleb Jackson. Um, he says, what players do you see us potentially uh, – being sellers on at the deadline. Um, he's, he lists uh, Brogdon, Rob Will, uh, maybe even Grant or Simons. I don't see Simons, but... Um. I think I think the main one would be Brogdon, obviously. Um, 
that's the most obvious one. Besides that, there's not really a bunch of guys that I can see us selling. Um, I think we're going to – I think if Robert Williams can stay relatively healthy and he should show some things, I think that's going to be a guy that we try to keep around. Um, Especially with his contract too. Like his contract's yeah. great. Like 13 mil over the next three years, I believe. Yeah. Um not like combined, but through three mil per, and that's a great contract, especially with how uh, to now's NBA is going contract wise. And mm-hmm. I mean, he's a when he's healthy, he's a defensive player of the year candidate. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I think I think they, I, I don't think there'll be much sellers. I think maybe they could look to trade Grant. Um, yeah, I was gonna say if Grant he, maybe if he does too much, you know, ISO and just doesn't really buy into his role. But yeah, no, I think Brogdon's that clear one. Um, I think the Brogdon sell also depends on what Portland looks like at that deadline and if what Portland wants, you know. If Portland's in that play-in mix or even say maybe they're in that 7-8 mix somehow at that time, I don't think they'll sell Brogdon. I think maybe they'll wait to the summer. Who knows? Like I said, Portland doesn't have a free agent for the next three years, which is beautiful. So that is one thing I do like is that we don't have a free agent for the next three, like a main free agent. You know, there's going to be those end of the bench guys. Like, but um, we don't have a main free agent for three years. We have everyone bought in. Uh, so I think Portland will be sellers at, to a T, a but that depends on what they look like. So good question. Um, we got about two more and then we kind of, or three more and we'll wrap it up. This next one's from Rondo. Um, he says, is it still controversial that we waived Trent in Watford or if we would have had a role if we kept him? And um, and then he also just kind of says, also quick prediction where you have finishing in standings. We kind of went across that, so we don't into that part. But um, I'll kind of answer this one first. I think yeah. the Trenton thing was surprising at the time because you're like, oh, Trenton's like was one of the bright spots on this team. You know, he really embraced Portland. Um, but looking at the team now, I just don't see where Trenton would have a role. Nowhere. <laughs> uh, no, he's yeah. a five. He's a five in this league, in my opinion, especially with how he's a shooter. He's a tweener. He's a tweener. He's like the yeah yeah. He's a he's a four five. Um, not quick enough to be a really a legitimate four. Um, so he he's a good he's a good good player though. You know he's gonna be good for Brooklyn. I think he's gonna make some good plays for them. He's a good playmaker. Um, he's a really good in the short roll. He's a really really good touch. Really Florida. good touch. Floater is just yeah. incredible. Um, but, yeah, I don't really think it's controversial now. Uh, I think it was at the time because you're like, what? Like, especially because it was like yeah. when we didn't really know much about Dame, too. Yeah, we were like, we were trying to get better still. That's kind of what we were thinking, right? Like, we want to build around Dame and then just waving Watford did not yeah. make sense. Yeah. yeah, no, not at all. Especially that early, too. It was really kind of surprising for me. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't think it's controversial now. I just don't really see a, a role for Trenton on this current roster. Um, this one, this next one's from David Lester. Um, how do you think the new rest rules for stars affects the season in the playoffs? Um, will teams find another way to work around it? Will teams turn over, perform, and yeah, uh, uh, will teams overperform in regular season and burn out more quickly in the playoffs? Um, I think the rest rules are are important. Um, you know, at the end of the line, I think there's it, there's it comes to like a, I say a, a 50-50 line where like if they're truly hurt, yeah, they shouldn't be playing. Like if that's like you don't want to risk injury, sure. But you know, you kind of look at the Clippers and how they've kind of handled that whole Kawhi thing. It's like, you know, people pay a lot of money to come see these dudes play. You know, Charles Barkley kind of said something about it. It was kind of an old head response, but you know, they do play two to three times a week and it shouldn't be that tough to get stars on the court, you know, especially like you know, people like you, know, you see all those sad stories where like people fly like, or come like across like thousands of miles to come see someone play, and they they're resting. Yeah. Just like you know, that 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 stuff sucks. You know, I don't think it's. I think people will find ways to re- like go around it. You know, how are you going to prove that someone's not hurt? Exactly. There definitely will be some loopholes in there, but I, I like what you said. Um, and I. Th- the guy that I really look at when it comes to this rest stuff, when I when I go back and look at some of the star players that we've had, Kobe Bryant, man, like this is one of the best players of all time. He had a quote where he was talking about like the reason why he wants to play every game, even if he's a little bit hurt, is because what if there's a, a fan that's never seen him play before, right? Yeah, Tatum um, said the same thing. So. Yeah, so like I love guys with that type of mindset. Um, it, it, I don't lo- I don't like this resting stuff that's going on. Um, we saw a much more physical NBA back in the day, and these guys did not have rest days like this. They were playing the same amount of games, more physical. 
I don't want to see this anymore. I know Kawhi injury. He's been very injury prone throughout his career. So with that being said, maybe there should be some um, exceptions for certain players that have are more injury prone, perhaps. But yeah, I, I think the new rules will definitely be some loopholes. But I think it's good to have that uh, in place. I think it's important for players to play, especially when you're healthy. Like, there's no reason for you to not be playing, unless, especially like in tank. That, that will help with tanking stuff too. It's like, especially you know, it sucks. Like you know how Portland maybe be a tanking team this year, but. You know, it, there's just no excuse for those guys not to be playing, especially with, with how the NBA is, how much people are paying for tickets now. Um, I'm not saying it's just about the fans. Obviously, it's about the players' health and how, it's well. But, you know, it's it's important for them to be on the court, especially if you're a star player. People are coming across the nation, coming across the world sometimes to come watch these people play. And it, it is a big thing if they don't. Cause, um, so I agree. I, like I said, I think there will be some loopholes. How are you going to really truly prove someone's not hurt? Are they going to have NBA personnel come out and check those injuries? So I, highly, I, yeah. I highly doubt that. Unless it becomes a problem, you know, like I could see maybe them trying that. But, yeah, I just don't. I don't see it. Um, the last question, I promised uh, I would answer this one. Uh, this one's from AJ from our boy in the group chat. Um, he says, who is your ideal three on the team, Sharp, Matisse, or Kamara? What's your expectations for Sharp? Um, you can go ahead and answer that first. We can kind of go. Ideally for me, it would probably be Shade and Sharp. Um, but obviously that's not going to be what the case is. Um, I think Matisse Thybul is kind of the safe guy to go with in that starting lineup. And with that being said, I, I have no problem with it. Kamara would be like the dark horse, kind of the flamboyant pick at the starting small forward spot. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I think Sharp would probably be the guy that I would have there if it was up to me. Um, but I can definitely understand having him come off the bench. It might be better for him. So, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think, like I said, I think my pick would be Tumani. That might just be jumping the gun, though. It's like, you know, Tumani showed some things. Um, I just like I just like what he brings to the table. Um, but then again, you know, it's like for me, it's like Matisse is that, sh- is that safe pick. But Shaden is that uh, pick you where it's like – do you really care what the Blazers' record is this year? Um, yeah, should Sharp, how I go about it. Yeah. Should Sharp be there, and should they just try out the trio of him, Anthony, and um, Scoo and see how that works? Um, yeah, I think that could be ideal. But I do think Portland is kind of treating this year as a maybe a stepping stone into success, and I think they want to try to win, and I think they want to try to – be, especially that's just kind of my vibe of what they've kind of presented this like maybe the preseason didn't go that way but you know keeping Brogdon and not flipping him um kind of having these vets around the team it, it, waving uh, uh Knox and picking up someone like Ish Wainwright um I think they want vets around this team and I think they really do want to try to have a good year um now, you can agree with that or not, but I just think that's what Portland's going to try to do. Um, me and you kind of talked about this last year. I think maybe they, <laughs> maybe in some sixth sense, they try to go out and be buyers at the deadline, depending on how, um, what, the, what, what their record is at the deadline. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I think that, I think my expectations to, to the last question of that for Sharp is just to continue to build off what he did last year. I think it's really important for Sharp to really show that he can be that guy. Um, that, and I think as a six man, he can show that. I think the, the ball is going to be in his hands a lot on that bench unit. Um, and I think guys like Brogdon are going to get him involved. Um, so I think my expectations for Sharp is to build off last year's success, show that you have a, you're a future superstar slash star, and uh, just kind of just keep growing. You know, it's it, he's 20 years old. Um, he can't even legally drink. He this is his second year. Um, he didn't even play college ball, so I would treat this almost like his rookie year in a sense. Um, so you know, I, I just think Sharp needs to continue to build off what he was and just not be a ghost on certain on certain teams. Yeah, for me, it's for Sharp. It's consistency with Sharp. I think yeah. if he can show us some consistency and maybe the numbers are somewhat similar, I hope he can shoot the ball a little bit better from three as well. Um, but yeah, just taking little steps like that to show that show us that he's getting better, showing us that he can be a consistent NBA player. He's not going to go through these like streaks where he's playing out of his mind, and then he goes through a week or two where he sucks, right? So exactly. So we want to see some more consistency with Sharp, and that's probably what I would expect from him the most is that consistency yeah. improvement. Yeah, yeah. He's just got to come off the bench and keep being him, and just you know really assert himself into this team because. He's going to be really important for this team if they want to have success this year. Agreed. Um, but, yeah, well, 
that was the last question. I think this is a really good episode. We have a lot to talk about. I think we'll I think we'll release one next week, and I think the Blazers will have three games underneath their belt. Yeah, two or three, yeah. I think it's three. Um, I think they so they played tomorrow, and then play Friday, and I think they play Sunday. So we'll have that recording day on that Monday. So, um, so yeah, no, I think we'll have some good things to talk about. Hopefully, the Blazers look like they're two and one or three and maybe three and zero. Hopefully, they're not zero and three um, at that time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, this was a really good episode. Remember to follow me at, at Twitter at 503 Blazer Fans, and you can follow Chase at down it's coming right It's going to come up. Down right, there, down right there. Down right there. I always forget about that. Um, but yeah, no, thank you guys for tuning in. It's been a good one, and I'm looking forward to episode three with you, Chase. Yes, sir. Have a good All one, right. guys. All right, thank you guys. Peace out.